picture of God and slight complaints of the things that it sees. Now, that's not quite right because it's the sight of faith that complains to God of the things that it sees. Uh, let's get this nailed down and start with. It's okay to trust God and complain about something. It's okay. Not necessarily complain about things to me or Helen or Caris or Tom or Andy Powell, but to complain to him. Or Caleb or Caleb. No, so, so that's why you've got so many complaints in the Bible against God. For God's book, it's got an awful lot of complaints against him in it. We don't see that, do we? You go through the book of Psalms, a third of the Psalms, at least, at least a third, are complaints. It's the worship book! A third of it is complaints! Because the way we perceive the world is uh, limited and uh, wrapped with pain. The pain of living in a fallen world and not understanding. And faith takes that to God. Faith does not allow that to drive a wedge between itself and God, but it takes it realistically and forthrightly to God. And having it do that. It's a natural question as you look out on a world that hurts. Verse 13b, why then do you tolerate the treacherous? I know you're like this, I trust you. I know that's right about you. But why do you tolerate that? Why do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Why? Why is that? It's a natural question. It's not just a Christian question, it's a natural question. I hear atheists asking that question because it is in our nature, however much we have a surprising ability to suppress it, it's in our nature to recognise a God and to reach out to Him for, for somebody to blame even when things don't suit our plans or our agenda. Where does an atheist believe in God? Well, he's got something to complain about. Against God. But do you notice what is surprisingly lacking in Habakkuk's complaint against God? Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? What's missing? Habakkuk is charging the one worthy being in the universe, the only one there is, with wrongdoing. But Habakkuk is mentioning no consciousness of sin in himself. No. He has conveniently forgotten about his own sin, his own sinfulness, in finding someone else who can accuse of injustice. And that's humanity for you, isn't it? We feel better about our own rubbish when we can find somebody else to accuse of injustice or whatever it is. <coughs> I've had that experience just in the last, you know, very, very recently. Someone's chosen a path that's not according to God's word and, and Whilst that's honestly acknowledged, there are others that follow. And we're all like that. And we all do it. Habakkuk attributes guilt to the Babylonians, guilt to God of all people, but his current thing attributes none of the responsibility to the people of Judah or to himself as their prophet, their watchman for God. You've got to watch that. An adequate sense of conviction of his own sin would have kept Habakkuk, or the people for whom he speaks, from attributing wrongdoing in this to God. And from piercing his own heart with all this grief. It's a complaint against God that God is silent. God's just spoken! Is God ever silent? His complaint is that God is silent whilst the wicked go gobbling up those who are more righteous than themselves. Here is what gives rise to his fierce outrage and indignation. Verses 14 to 16. The sovereign God offers no protection. Verse 14. Now we can feel like that. We know it's not true because we see instances where his protection is pretty patent and obvious. Right? But when you're in this bind, when you're thrashing around and you're hurting with it all, Lord, why aren't you looking after me? And he is. But it don't feel like it. 
Here's what gives rise to Habakkuk's fierce indignation. You have made people, verse 14, like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. So, in the ancient Near Eastern political system, a ruler was there to lead out the armies, give protection to his subjects in the land. And life without active governance in that situation would be nasty, poor, brutish and short, to use Bob's description of life in a state of nature. Right? Kings were there to deal with all of this. So Habakkuk is actually accusing God, Israel's covenant king, with a serious dereliction of his duty. With abandoning his covenant faithfulness. Because you've made us like this fish, you've got no ruler. No ruler for what? No ruler to protect them. The Israelites are like fish. Landlocked Judea. The fish seem to be utterly unprotected. Mere quarry to be predated. And they aren't simply vulnerable, they are being predated upon. And this next bit in verse 15, it looks like a poetic flight of fancy, doesn't it? The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet, strange expression. And so he rejoices and is glad. What's going on? Looks like a sort of poetic description of the fish and stuff. But actually, you know, the Babylonians did this. They did pull up the Israelites with hooks. That, that's a, a carved relief of, of, of from Babylonia, of the way that they led captives away into captivity. That is horrible stuff, gory kind of you, isn't it? But what they did with their captives was they put hooks through their bottom lip and tied it to a rope and led them off single fire to captivity. Horrendous people! Horrendous things happening! They invaded the land, they took captives, they pushed hooks through their bottom lip, and they led them off single file to Babylon. It happened to the people of Judah, and there's the archaeological evidence for it. Additionally, there are inscriptions about the net. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks, he catches them in his net. His dragnet. There are inscriptions, and old Palmer Robertson refers to them in his commentary, to captives being taken to Babylonia, being netted and dragged along the ground by horses in the net to Babylon. Can you see where the complaint of Habakkuk is coming from? It's born right out of the suffering and humiliation of the people of God. What doesn't accompany this complaint is any sense for the moment of the unworthiness of the people, which gives rise to all this. An unworthiness Habakkuk was, in fact, complaining about just a little bit earlier on, do you remember? See, here's the problem. We all want God to end sin, and therefore the suffering it causes. We just don't want Him to end ours. And we don't want Him to end it His way. We certainly don't want Him to do it now. It's a Habakkuk cries out. Not least, because of all this humiliation, the enemy rejoices and is glad. Verse 15. He rejoices. Over us. He has the final hurtful humiliation in the list, being laughed at. Having the ungodly rejoice over our sorry but unrepentant condition. Having it's outraged. God has given no protection. The wicked foe rejoices. And verse 16 goes on and indulges in idolatry because of it. How odd is that? Idolatry and self-interest go hand in hand. Deifying what gives you what your flesh craves is very common. Therefore he sacrifices to his net. Burns incense to his dragon. For by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choices People idolise what gives them what their flesh craves. Habakkuk is outraged by that. And he cries out to God. And he comes right back to how long, verse 17. Is he to go on emptying his net? Destroying nations without mercy. 
we know Paul's not happy you know the answer to that question, you've got your Old Testament, you know it's there. God is going to raise up a ruler who will reign in righteousness. And you're railing against God, but God is going to reign. He's, going to, he's, he's got this in hand. He's, he's, he's working this out. And times seem confusing and hard and difficult. God's got a plan. You know God's got a plan. He is the Holy God. He is the one who's too righteous to look upon God. You know where this is going, Habakkuk. You were told. You were told way back before the monarchy was started, before all this, all this political system was erected. You were told. You know where this is going. And then here's the big challenge of this, and here's the big challenge of it to Habakkuk, and here's the big challenge of it to us as we go through lesser experiences of things that seem to not meet our expectations of God. But perhaps our expectations are not actually in line with the truth, with the way it is. Habakkuk, are you living in this moment? Or are you living with your eyes set on the future that God has prepared for his people and that he's moving this to? Because here's what the Bible tells us. Here's what Habakkuk knows the Bible tells him. Here's what Habakkuk knows about the character of God. God is not dead, but alive and active and working through human lives in the world in which things are not as we would like them to be. To get this world to a point where things are where we do want it to be. We understand that he plans for it to be. And are we living now with our eyes fixed here? Or are we living with our eyes fixed in God's future? And with where this is actually all getting us. See, that's, that's where faith happens. When things are turning out not as we expect and not as we aspire to, where do we go? Habakkuk goes back to the character of God. Now he's not unrealistic in this. He's not unrealistic in saying, oh well rejoice anyway and all that nonsense. He's saying, but Lord, I've got to hold this, what I see, together with that which I know. By faith in you. And where else am I going to go to? Because you have the words of eternal life and coming to you. There's nowhere else to go. Coming to you. And Lord, this looks wrong. And Lord, this is an outrage. And Lord, this is humiliating. And here's my big complaint. He's back to how long this. He knows that's the big thing. Because it's a matter of how long. Because it's not going to be like this forever. Can he hold that? Because he's living for the future of God's plan and purpose and what God is doing, mm -hmm. even now. And which we will, we will be going to see. But don't see yet. Don't see because of our sinfulness, because of our need to be brought into his plans and purposes, and because our perspective on what is happening is so limited. Because faith says, Oh Lord, this hurts! But it goes on trusting. There's the challenge of this passage of scripture from Habakkuk. And next time, we're going to see how God responds to that. Which is quite surprising. And the time after that, we'll see an enormous change in Habakkuk.